Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series. I am really absolutely delighted to welcome today's speaker, Mary Nichols. Very exciting. Mary has been described as the most influential environmental regulator in history. And she's known as California's hashtag clean air guru. She pushed forward clean air and decarbonization programs under four California governors. And as we know, where California goes, there goes the United States. Mary is perhaps most famous for her long tenure as the chair of the California Air Resources Board, which runs California's renowned cap and trade program, which we will talk about more shortly. Today, Mary serves with Ford CEO Jim Foley as the co-chair of the Coalition for Reimagined Mobility and as vice chair of the California China Climate Institute with former governor Jerry Brown of California. During her leadership at the California Air Resources Board, California became a national and global leader developing clean energy and clean transportation solutions that many other states and nations have consequently adopted. Mary has a deep understanding of what businesses will need to do to lead and support the many transformations of our economy that will be necessary to avert the looming climate crisis. Here at Haas, we're talking about sustainability and climate change a lot. In particular, how businesses and industry can take a leading role in developing a sustainable, climate resilient economy. We know that every aspect of business, whether it's agriculture, real estate, energy, finance, corporations, will need to be reimagined and will need to be redesigned to address the current environmental, social, and economic crisis. In today's conversation, we'll be exploring that question, and in particular, how government policy can work with industry and the critical role that policy will play along with business in this transition. Thank you so much, Mary, for taking the time to be with us here today. We are Pleasure. absolutely thrilled. Thanks for inviting me. So Mary, let's start a little bit with your background. You studied law at Yale, the greatest law school in the country. Your first job after law school in 1971 was at the Center for Law in the Public Interest in Los Angeles, working as the air lawyer. Now, what drew you to environmental issues rather than some other area of the law when there was not even such a thing as an environmental lawyer? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's uh, important to recognize for many people, including me, when you actually uh, look back on your career, you realize that a lot of it was based on avoidance as opposed to uh, attraction. That is, I, <laughs> I did not want to go work for a uh, corporate law firm, which is what most people did uh, when you graduate from a school like Yale Law School, especially if you have loans, but even if you didn't have big loans to pay off, um, the uh, the feeling when I graduated in 1971 was we were going to be making policy for the country because this was a time, you know, right at the sort of peak in many ways of um, the civil rights movement when um, people thought that law could be a force for good, for social change, not just not bad, but actually the way that you could go about making change happen was as a lawyer, you could think of a good theory and go to court. You could have uh, clients that had not previously had access to the law and make law for them um, using existing statutes. So. Uh, it was a time when going to law school was considered a, a progressive thing to do, and I certainly didn't go thinking that I was going to make a lot of money. Um, I came from, this is you know probably more than you need to know, but um, my parents were first generation college graduates. So my grandparents were the immigrants and they were the blue collar 
union people. My parents both went to college, actually got advanced degrees and became teachers. And um, so I'm kind of the next wave. My brother is a doctor, and I'm a lawyer. It's the perfect, <laughs> the, the perfect storm, right? The perfect scenario for uh, Jewish parents. So they got one, one of each. Um, so bottom line is, when I went to law school, I had had experience working in the civil rights movement and working in a foundation that was involved in criminal justice reform. And I was very interested in both of those things. But as it happened, I was also moving to Los Angeles because I'd gotten married to somebody who wanted to move to LA, and I was very happy about that anyway from a pure, um, you know, physical comfort. I was very happy to get away from the winters on the East Coast. And um, so I went looking for a job. And what was happening at that time, what was going on, was the beginnings of the environmental movement. So. Um, I found a way through air pollution, I think, to link social action and um, environmental protection. So I wasn't in those days, you know, a conservation lawyer. I wasn't so interested <coughs> as some of my colleagues were in preserving things. You know, I wanted to uh, be involved in, before it even had a name, really in uh, promoting um, community justice through the environment. Thank you for that. And we're all so fortunate that you made that decision. Uh, California has really benefited. Um, so along those same lines, uh, what do you see as some of the most important sustainability challenges that our students here in this business school are likely to encounter as they become business leaders? And in particular, what role do you see for private companies to actually lead the transition to clean energy in a low carbon economy. I, uh, I was at a dinner not too long ago with a man who's made a fortune as an investor and is one of a number of people like that who are giving money towards environmental protection and um, towards uh, climate change in particular. And he expressed the opinion that capitalism was incapable of dealing with climate change. And he wasn't actually being facetious. He, was, uh, he has come to the point in his own evaluation of, of the world that he really didn't think that there was a way that you could harness capitalist um, impulses or to the system and address what needs to be done in order to deal with the ongoing crisis of climate change. Well, I'm close to it. <laughs> I don't think it's impossible, but that's because I have a career and a history as a regulator, and I do believe regulation can um, contain the worst of capitalism and still allow for the best of it. So, in other words, I haven't seen anything that made me think that China or Russia, when Russia was still a place uh, that you could talk about, um, are, is going to do better than we are um, at, uh, at dealing with climate change at all. Uh, but I do think that the current political climate, which is one where governments are incapable of mustering the political will to uh, act in a way that puts a check on capitalism and are relying completely on voluntary actions um, will not succeed. It hasn't succeeded yet, and I don't think it. I don't think it will. So the government isn't succeeding, um, and you're worried about the private sector's ability to succeed. But what about something like electric vehicles? I mean. What well, role did the public and the private sectors play there? I think th that's a terrific example of how government and, uh, and businesses can work together if there's a general acceptance that each has a role to play and there's something that everybody agrees has to be done. I mean, we've been trying, we now meeting California, you know, for decades to deal with the problem of vehicle pollution. And we worked on the fuels, we worked on the engines, we were, and we adopted regulations that systematically ratcheted down on the allowable emissions. So before we really got seriously into zero emission vehicle requirements, um, 
an internal combustion engine that you could buy in a car in California emitted about one one hundredth of the pollutants that it would have emitted if you had bought that same model from Ford or GM or whoever, you know, in 1970. So incredible progress, technology rising to meet the demand, California making the demand, knowing what technology was capable of doing and coming together with a strong regulatory program. We also, of course, as California, we're a big enough market so that companies design cars to, uh, you know, to meet our needs. Global warming takes you a, to a whole new level. Um, I mean, we needed, we in California need zero emission vehicles for urban air pollution reasons. And so do places like uh, Shanghai or Beijing or, or uh, Delhi or um, you know, Indonesia, et cetera. But um, the, most of the world doesn't really. It's, you know, it's, it's urban needs that are sort of driving it. But the world needs vehicles if you're going to have personal transportation or you're going to move in any kind of a global economy. You're going to move goods around. You've got to have emission-free transportation, essentially. So we started to make that leap in California, and fortunately, um, enough of the companies could see the handwriting on the wall, especially with Europe jumping in in a very aggressive way that they um, rose to meet the challenge. And so we went from hearing that electric vehicles were always going to be a niche market and would never be able to be sold at prices that uh, you know real people would possibly be willing to pay to a point now where every auto company is seriously making zero emission vehicles and they're marketing them and they're still not the majority of what they sell, but they're going to be there pretty soon. So, so let me paraphrase that. It, it, it's an interesting world where if you have a big market like California, a strong forward-looking regulatory framework combined with an innovating, um, exciting, visionary private sector mm -hmm. can, can together, working yes. together, solve this problem. So let me ask along those lines, tell us about your experience in particular with Volkswagen and Dieselgate, as it's called, and then Volkswagen's switch to supporting California's strict environmental standards. This was an interesting example where there wasn't participation, but a, a company saw the light. What lessons would you offer our students about business and government working together in both designing, but even more importantly, implementing environmental regulations. Yeah, well, so this is sort of a good and a bad example, but the lesson that you draw from it to begin with is that regulations are only as good as your ability to enforce them. And in this case, Volkswagen for a number of years, and they were not the only company that was doing this. They just did it in a bigger and more egregious way. They came up with a way of evading our um, um, emissions requirements for nitrogen oxides, uh, which uh, are directly related to combustion, to how much, how much fuel is being combusted, um, by finding a way to basically turn off the monitoring system uh, in the vehicle itself under certain driving conditions. So it would meet the emissions requirements when it was on the dynamometer being tested to be allowed to be sold, but wouldn't meet it in the real world. And we became aware you, of that. How did you figure <laughs> out that there was cheating going well, on? Well, actually, the Europeans, who were very big on diesels, uh, were the ones who first started to complain about how uh, they weren't seeing in the real world where they went out and measured air quality, the benefits that they should have seen from these new clean vehicles that were out there on the road. California started testing and we did roadside testing also. And then we actually went and bought cars and put them on dynamometers with uh, equipment and saw how they were operating during the test and figured out what was what was going on. This was helped a lot also by the fact that a uh, sort of middle level engineer who had been working, uh, he was part of the government affairs team at Volkswagen, um, confessed. 
to one of my staff people what was going on because he saw that we were getting close to figuring it out, but he also was so himself so uh, ashamed of what was happening, so upset about what was happening that he felt like he had to tell somebody what was going on. That's an incredible so story. So that's how we found out. Then, of course, this explodes into a huge enforcement action. We brought it to the federal government. It wasn't because the federal government didn't care, but we sort of had a agreement with them based on how we could allocate our resources that we'd start certain areas of enforcement, they'd do others. We would just share the burden of enforcement on motor vehicles. So this one was ours to begin with, but then they took it up. And together we pursued the court actions, which eventually resulted in a settlement, which was the largest consent decree ever for uh, anything related to automotive pollution. And while that was all going on, the German government got involved, the European Union got involved, there was horrible publicity, and um, the company was under investigation by their own parliament, you know, Volkswagen. And in general, the EU regulations were not as strict as California's, and they didn't enforce them as much as the U.S. did. But um, in this instance, they felt like they were being embarrassed. And the German government, which has a particularly close relationship because of its history with Volkswagen, couldn't just turn the other way. And so they were threatening all kinds of reforms. Volkswagen ended up throwing out its board of directors, firing the CEO. Um, you know, they, they found that the knowledge of what was going on went all the way up to the top. And then, at the end of it all, not only did they pay their fines and come into compliance, uh, but they decided to use this as a, as a way to actually reinvent the company in a very major way. And their decision was to um, not just to satisfy California's demand that they produce electric vehicles, but to actually uh, commit to making all of their products electric before anybody else uh, was doing that and to spin off a company, and this was part of the settlement with us, a company that would build electric charging stations because obviously one of the, one of the things that has slowed down the transformation of this uh, industry is that you can't just work on the vehicle. You have to be looking at the fuel at the same time, and there was a real question about whether there was going to be enough charging for these new vehicles. So. That's an incredible story. I mean, to think that you turned around this company from, you, from your office where you were, that that led to this incredible transformation is just such an amazing story. I think it's a great story for Volkswagen. And they, I mean, the fact that in the end, of the, in the end they chose to use this as a positive um, uh, push to do something that maybe some people of the company had been thinking about for a while, but uh, they would never have been able to do it without that. And it is a good example, I think, of how you can actually use enforcement as a way to uh, benefit the private sector as well. So as an environmental regulator, you've often faced extreme lobbying against environmental regulations by industry and business. But we know that at other times, some parts of industry have supported or even encouraged government efforts to regulate pollution or emissions of greenhouse gases. So when do you see the interaction between business and regulators at their most effective and productive? Um, and do you think that businesses are more receptive now to policymaking than they were when you started your career? Well, over the years, I think both sides have evolved. And Certainly, I spent a lot more time in my last few years at uh, the Air Resources Board meeting with business representatives than I ever did in the early years. And we were holding the kinds, of, I mean, we, we always had informal workshops where businesses could come in and talk to the regulators, but they weren't, they were talking mostly at the technical level. 
uh, as time went on, and you know, and you could see this as maybe government and business getting too cozy, and people could be suspicious of it. But I think both sides came to believe that we had to understand each other's motives, and we had to also be able to make suggestions about ways things could be done better, which are very hard to really surface effectively if you're doing it at a public hearing where you're up on a dais and somebody is coming before you and reading a statement. You're just not going to be able to engage in uh, some of the best kind of thinking and, uh, and, and policy making. So um, I have thought for a long time that you know, the California success in the early days, especially in our air quality programs, is really largely dependent on voluntary goodwill by companies in California, which didn't mean that they always agreed with us or always liked what we were doing. But especially in the case of larger companies, they tend to have Volkswagen being a, an example of why this isn't always true, but they tend to actually have a strong uh, commitment to following the law once it is the law. And so, um, so we got a lot more compliance than we could have gotten if we actually had tried to, you know, be out there policing every every car that rolled off the assembly lines. But with global warming, I think we're in a different world um, because the problem is so complex, and we're back at the stage where every sector wants to claim that it's somebody else's fault or somebody else should be doing more. And so coming up with a common vision of what the program should be has proven to be pretty elusive. I mean, over the last decade or more, there have been groups, coalitions of different companies that have come together around the idea that um, there needs to be some form of a price on carbon which absolutely, by the way, has to happen. I mean, whether it's through a cap and trade program, which is actually more difficult, or through some sort of tax, which you can then work through uh, how you deal with borders and boundaries and all of that. But if there isn't a way to spread uh, knowledge and acceptance of the fact that carbon is causing problems throughout the economy, we we will not make it to anything like the goals that we have, which may be too hard anyway right now. But let's just say, you know, even if we decide it's going to be two degrees of warming or more than two degrees of warming, and it's not going to be 2050, it's going to be 2060, whatever it is, we won't get there if we can't figure out a way to put a price on carbon. And industry has actually been not always and not in every sector more forthright about saying that than... Um, you know, that many in the political world or in, the, you know, in other forms of advocacy groups. I mean, the, putting a price on carbon has been the goal for, I guess, for decades. Do you have any idea how to do it since nobody's been able to figure it out yet? Well, I mean, the California program of cap and trade is a way of putting a price on carbon. It just gives certainty to the allowable amount and then companies can trade underneath the cap versus the tax where the certainty is around what the price is and people can make their own decisions based on the uh, on the price that's allocated. It's a, two sides of the same coin, really. And actually, although it's been very slow, um, you know, other there are other jurisdictions that have actually implemented cap and trade programs since we did. Of course, we started with Quebec as our partner. The, province in Canada, which, you know, is, looks very different from California in some ways, but has very similar kind of environmental ethic. Uh, they've been joined by other Canadian provinces. Uh, once Canada decided that all of their um, states, all of their provinces would have to put uh, some kind of a price on carbon. So they actually did that at the national level. So, so let's get back to the California cap and trade model, which, as you point out, is a way of putting a price on carbon. How, in that case, were you able to get business in agreement with you to make that model work? And even though we're just a state, we're the equivalent of one of the largest countries in the world. Well, uh, first of all, um, you know, the program has been criticized because in the beginning, we didn't auction off the allowances. We actually allocated them freely uh, to most of the businesses that were subject to the program. So within California, we started with only the 700 largest emitters. 
we added fuels after that. So natural gas and, and, uh, and uh, gasoline and diesel fuel came under the cap and trade program in kind of the second wave. The first wave was just the, the companies. And we came up with a, a system in which we allocated um, allowances by sector um, based on a sort of a average of efficiency within that sector. So the most efficient company, let's say among oil refineries, might get actually all the allowances that they could use and the least efficient would not get as many. So the least efficient was forced to work, to move harder. Right. 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 And within each of those sectors, let's say oil and gas, um, ultimately there was enough agreement on the part of the companies that thought they were going to come out ahead um, so that they actually embraced the cap uh, versus uh, fighting it. And they were also afraid that being California, if we didn't, if, if they didn't come along and help design a program that they could live with, um, it, would, it could be worse. You know, we might have banned all oil drilling, and there's still people who were, you know, mad at Jerry Brown because he didn't ban all oil and gas drilling in California, which um, he could have done legally. I mean, he made a decision politically that, and it was sort of a moral decision too that. Um, as long as people in California were using the product, we shouldn't just pretend that we weren't going to produce any of it in California. Huh, interesting. Um, so let, let, let me ask you another question about cap and trade. Um, so I guess the idea behind cap and trade is where the scope for improving efficiency and reducing pollution is the greatest uh, is where you would do that. But at the same time, some groups don't like cap and trade because companies can buy cheaper emission reductions outside their own factory gates. So they right. can find a way of not actually reducing pollution in their own uh, premises. Um, wh what's your response to that critique of cap and trade? Well, <laughs> from the very beginning, it seemed to me that it was there was some confusion about what we were trying to accomplish. That if your goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, companies that are subject to the program are not going to choose to keep their oldest, least efficient plants going. They're going to pump up production from their newest, most efficient plants. And so the idea that they would be deliberately continuing to pollute in the low income, most impacted communities because of this program just didn't make logical sense. But if you think about this from the perspective of a community group who's really not primarily concerned about global warming, their real concern is the emissions from the diesel trucks that are pulling up to the factory gate or the other toxic contaminants that the factory is, uh, is uh, emitting, you can see why they would not want to buy into a program where those emissions at that site were not being specifically addressed. And so um, this has been a tension from the very beginning. And one of the things I think it's brought to the fore, especially with the increasing organizational uh, power of uh, environmental justice communities, is a stronger emphasis on localized pollution controls at those facilities and making sure that the program doesn't do anything that actually incentivizes continued operation of the of the plants that are But of most course irritating. it is it is less efficient than yes, that's yes. right. So now the cap and trade program is not pure anymore. It's less yeah. efficient. Huh. Right. Interesting. Um, so for for everyone here if you would give one message to all our students in our community here, what would be the one thing that you, should, you would tell them to do to try to address climate change right now? 
You know, I don't think there is one thing you can tell people to do. I think the message is you got to act with urgency wherever you see the opportunity, but at the same time recognize that this is a fight that we're going to be in for the rest of our lives, the rest of my life and the rest of your lives as well. And so you need to figure out how to incorporate that kind of thinking and policy and recognize that you're going to have to be a part of it no matter what. <laughs> Nobody gets to escape being part of fighting climate change, and no one entity can be the ones that solve it all either. I mean, you could say energy as a, as a thing is like 70% emissions from energy as a whole, but if you try to break that down into the various components, it becomes pretty clear that you know, just building solar, if you're not retiring other things, just uh, switching to electric cars, just doing a better job with waste or, you know, stopping meat production. Uh, it, it, you, no one of those things in and of itself is going to do it. It's going to require we all do what we can and also that we be more holistic in our thinking, I think. So, so that leads me to my next question. California is approach is perhaps less holistic in the sense that the climate strategy is to try to electrify as much as possible mm -hmm. from cars to buses to buildings. On the other hand, our electricity grid in California is increasingly subject to a lot of stresses, wildfires, blackouts. How do we reconcile this push towards electrifying everything with the increasing lack of uh, stability of our electrical grid. We've known for a long time that we were going to need to build more generation in California, and also that we could do much better at deploying electricity if we had a regional grid with other states that was uh, more closely tied to each state's abilities and needs to um, consume and generate at different times of the day. So we now in California generate more solar electricity in the middle of the day than we can use. We literally dump electricity that, that could be put to work because we don't have enough demand for it. We have more demand at the end of the day, late in the day and early evening hours and into the evening, then we can satisfy with solar. Uh, we have some wind and we have some other resources, but basically we need to be importing from Wyoming and other places in the evening hours. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to share uh, if we could work out the politics of uh, making a more uh, efficient and equitable system overall. There's also a lot of room for micro grid technologies where you bring it down to the local level and work your timing of things. We know we can do a lot more with storage so that when there is excess electricity, you can uh, save it in um, batteries or other ways. And there's also the possibility increasingly now being looked at and used where uh, an electric car can be its own storage system and be part of a little electric system in its neighborhood and within its house so that when there is excess electricity on the grid, you can be charging your car. And when there isn't, your, charge has a, your car has a bi-directional uh, plug and you could actually be giving electricity back to the house. And that's a very s simplistic explanation. But that, but that actually can happen and now does happen. You know, if you, a Ford 150 truck comes with um, electric outlets on it. So a lot of people who could care less about being in a zero emission vehicle love the idea that they could be off road in their truck and be plugging in all sorts of other cool appliances out wherever it is they are. So, you know, <laughs> this is this is a way more interesting and diverse uh, uh, system than certainly it seemed to be when, you know, a few years ago, people were just thinking about one power plant with lines radiating out, and that was the, what the whole system was. Still, um, we, we're going to need more. I mean, we, there's no way around that, and um, we all want more things that are electric. 
We do consider, by the way, um, not just battery electrics, but um, fuel cell vehicles are electric drive vehicles. And so there's, there is a place in the economy for us and for many parts of the world for a hydrogen um, running a fuel cell to be a big part of this electric future that we're talking about. But there's nothing in the fact that, you know, on a very, very hot day this year, we were worried about whether there were going to have to be some blackouts. That tells you nothing about where we're going to be in a few years, because we're just we're moving ahead on all these other fronts. Thank you for that. I mean, one <laughs> of the things we really emphasize here at Haas is the power of innovation, and also we're focusing Absolutely. on sustainability. And so the inter right. intersectionality mm -hmm of innovating and sustainability is right. just so incredibly important. As a trade economist, I also like what you're saying about the opportunity to trade uh, energy across mm -hmm. time zones mm -hmm. and locations. I think there's tremendous potential there. So now we're going to change uh, we're going to change the focus a little bit and talk about China. So China's the largest emitter uh, of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the world. Um, but the China, the California to further climate action between California and China. Um, so that area, climate change, has long been one of the few reliable areas of productive collaboration between the U.S. and China. Can you tell us more about the work of that institute? Um, and how does this current tension that we're seeing between the U.S. and China uh, affect the work of that institute? Well, it has been affected to the extent that exchanges of the kind that we were hoping would occur where scholars from one country would go and spend time in the other uh, have been pretty dramatically affected. But uh, it is interesting that at a time when you know, between the U.S. and China at the national level, there's probably more tension than um, general uh, lack of uh, sense of collaboration than there has been for many, many years right now. Uh, but the work of the Institute has continued both, um, both in China and in California. We have people working together and um, they, they can share documents and, you know, work together over the Internet. And they are publishing a group of papers, uh, a, a set of papers that are going to be coming out quite soon. They're in circulating in draft form right now, uh, where they'll have on 10 sort of big topic areas, uh, papers that talk about what both China and California, or really China and the US, can do uh, to meet our uh, goals under the Paris Accord. And that is an effort which has been um, I wouldn't say sponsored, but it was actually it has been sponsored in a, a formal way um, by the State Department, which um, had uh, at Glasgow uh, they began a, a process of re revitalizing a China. Cal I keep saying China, California. The Institute is China and California, but the, the agreement is between China and the U.S. Uh, to collaborate on developing China solutions. That really goes back to uh, Obama uh, when he invited uh, the premier of, of China to come over, and they spent time together and announced a series of things that they wanted to work on on climate. And the Chinese are very serious about this stuff. I mean, they're, they're having political problems of their own internally as well. And, you know, the effects of COVID have been disastrous as far as their economy is concerned. But they continue to um, just produce uh, uh, renewable energy at a record rate. And they have implemented a cap and trade program for electric generation in, in China. Yeah, no, I'm I'm aware of that, having done a lot of research on on China. And if you just um, if you look at aerial photographs of mm -hmm. Beijing over decades um, before, you couldn't see Beijing at all. And right. the progress that has been made mm -hmm. is really remarkable. I have one final question before I open it up to the floor. Um, after I ask my question, and and you'll give us your thoughts on that. If you want to ask a question, you can then go to the mic and you can identify yourself and, and, and ask your question. So my, my last question here is, um, what would you recommend for Haas students or for non-Haas students for that matter, 
who want to lead businesses and also contribute to sustainability and climate solutions. So where should they be looking to make the biggest impact? Um, I really wish that I had a good, simple answer to give to that question. But one of the things that I think uh, we need to recognize is that given the vast amount of change that has to happen throughout society, um, maybe the goal of being a leader, even though we do need leaders, isn't necessarily the most important thing. I mean, if you're going to be the leader in something, you should be a leader that makes climate a big part of your <laughs> part of your uh, uh, portfolio of what you're going to be working on. But you don't have to be. Uh, your goal doesn't have to be the leader if you are serving the purpose of building a community of people or groups that are addressing this issue collectively because this is about doing things for the public good as opposed to only for the good of your own company. So, you know, it's a little bit antithetical in some ways to the desire, which I'm sure all the kinds of people who come and get degrees here, you know, have that leadership gene in them, and they all have the potential to be leaders wherever they are. But I th I'm personally at a point now where I'm beginning to think that maybe we need more people who are doers, <laughs> wherever they happen to be, uh, working together to solve problems, because we're seeing the levels of resistance and backlash to anything that involves asking people to share in the common good. So if you can't do it by mandating people to do whatever it is you want them to do, you really have to have people agreeing voluntarily that this is what they want to do. And it may mean that being a leader means, you know, being a leader of your PTA, <laughs> you know, just to pick an example. I don't mean to put down on PTAs. I think they're actually very powerful. Um, it's a, it, But we have to agree with each other that this is something that we, uh, you know, that we all can agree that we want to do, and that means talking to other people, engaging with other people, which is kind of the opposite of what you think of as the, you know, the hard-driving CEO personality. It, it's interesting because leadership these days is is a lot about influence, and so we had at, in a former Dean Speaker series we had. Um, we had uh, General McChrystal, who, mm. who led the armed forces, and he talked about how in the military, even though the military, is, we think of it as a hierarchical in mm -hmm. organization, it's all about leadership through influencing people, okay. inspiring people, uh, educating people. So mm -hmm. on that note, I would love to hear the first question. Speaking with us today, um, I'm Will. I'm an MBA student here at Berkeley Haas. My question is, looking forward, what regulation do you see as being essential that isn't out there today? Can you translate the question? Like, um, What's the critical new regulation that needs to be passed? Ah. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I um, have a little feedback in my hearing, I think, but also, um, it is hard for a person who has to stoop down to speak into the microphone, so I, I appreciate your patience. Um, so uh, I think the most critical new regulation that we need at the national level um, probably uh, builds on what's already in the Inflation Recovery Act that was out there. So you know we were able to get money, very large amounts of money passed, but very little in the way of mandates as to how it's to be spent. Um, probably the most important thing, though, if you would sort of took a step back would be to what we could get rid of by way of subsidies for the oil and gas industry. There's still way too much in the current system that is keeping us from making the changes that we need to make. So um, 
in, in addition to my carbon tax idea, um, which is not my idea, but uh, some form of a carbon tax, I think we probably need to close loopholes or close very long-standing um, special benefits that are enjoyed because there's no, uh, th there's really just no hope to make it to our uh, climate goals if we can't hasten the departure of our current, uh, our current system. I'll, I'll buck the trend of needing to lean down. I'll have to go up to the mic. Uh, um, anyways, I'm Chris. I'm a first-year MBA student here as well. I just recently was working on the Clean Energy Transportation Group over at PG&E. Um, so we dealt a fair amount with California regulators. Um, so my question to you is how do you see the sort of like need for regulation and in with sort of private companies versus the like stifling nature that sometimes that can have for innovation. So for instance, our group, we wanted to go out and like install more chargers, but we were actually limited by our regulators to do that. And so how do you see like the balance of like checks and balances put in place for safety and other requirements versus like allowing pure innovation to take over? Well, I have been a fan of the kind of regulations that we did going back into the 1970s that forced uh, big improvements in the internal combustion engine uh, where we didn't specify what technologies the companies had to use. We specified an emissions level and let them decide what was going to be the way to, to get there. And I still think that performance-based regulation is preferable to technology-based regulation and that there's plenty of spaces where that, where that can, still, uh, can still be applied. Um, I do think that um, there need to be more incentives for breakthroughs in technology than there are today. And um, we also have to look at the ways in which systems work together. So if we can't ultimately find ways to reduce the need for people to drive, it'll take a whole lot longer to get to where we need to go in terms of emissions from that sector. So um, certainly in this country, the thing that's been the hardest to tackle is how to, um, how to create the ability to build new housing and at the same time, you know, build it in ways and in places where people can bike, walk, and otherwise, you know, lead healthier lives than if they have to be providing uh, time and space for their vehicles. So it's, a, it's, it's more of a holistic pattern. And I think the failures of the regulatory system tend to be more where one set of regulators isn't looking at what other regulators are doing and figuring out how to get them to work together. One of the things that I thought um, President Biden did sort of early on, which I, I don't think got a lot of attention, but was actually one of the hardest things ever to do in government, is that he took two cabinet agencies, the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation, and he made them start a new program jointly together around electrification of the transportation system. So, you know, each one has its own pride, it has its own ideas about how they should be done, but when it comes to deployment of electric charging, they are absolutely um, joined at the hip, and one can't move without the other. That is, uh, that is really policy making at its hardest. Great. Um, my name is Meredith Fowley. I'm a professor of economics from RCNR, or the College of Natural Resources. Thanks so much for being here. Quick question about cap and trade. Uh, so I share your view that it's really an important part of the sort of the large policy landscape. Uh, and California had been leading, uh, but as you see, Canada and Washington and Europe push forward. It's playing a diminished role in the, in the scoping plan. It has no official future past 2030, which I'm concerned about. So I guess given that you are such an instrumental part of the launch of the cap and trade program, I'm wondering if you can comment on the, on the future trajectory given sort of where things seem to be going and then where they could be going with some sort of policy leadership. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, you reach a point where you have to sort of decide if the price of the allowances has gotten to a point where that in and of itself is going to cause a political backlash. And because there's such a narrow um, 
set of people who actually are subject to the requirements. Um, I, we're not there yet, but you could easily foresee that after 2030, you could be at that point, in which case you'd be looking for a better way to spread the costs than just through the carbon allowances. I mean, California's program, I think, is unique in the way that it blends direct regulation with a cap and trade program, and the, the cap is the key thing, not the, not the price on carbon. But when you start to really lower the cap dramatically, then the price of carbon obviously does have to go up because there just aren't enough allowances around for the people who need them. And then you have to decide whether there's some other uh, technique that's going to come along that's going to be more effective at um, allowing for things like cement to continue to be produced. Or you have to decide you're not going to produce cement anymore. Um, and so I think they're, they're looking in a pretty scalpel-like way at where you can do more with regulation and where you can do more with, uh, with the cap-and-trade system and not ready to really um, come down one way or the other. Meantime, if I'm right, that the United States at some point is going to have to kind of find a way to work its way towards a carbon tax, then you're going to have to figure out how to layer that on top of the existing cap-and-trade program. So, um, I mean, I, I believed at the time we started the program that there was going to be a federal program and that we would eventually have to negotiate where our system could be folded into a federal system. I still think that that's the most desirable goal. I don't think we should be aiming towards a system where every state has its own um, you know, if, if Oregon and Washington are able to develop their programs in a way that allows for meaningful um, linkage, real linkage between the three, then it might become more possible. But, um, you know, we're not the, uh, even as, as the Pacific West, it's still not a big enough market to really, um, I think, keep, keep things moving as far as we need for them to go. I think we have time for one last question. Hi, uh, my name is Arno, a first year MBA student. Uh, so up to now, much of the focus has been on uh, carbon dioxide, very little on methane, uh, though it's a much more powerful uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, what regulations and policies do you think uh, states and countries should take to cut these uh, methane emissions? What policies what? should they? Uh, what 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 to do about regulating Regula methane? Yeah, no, I, okay. Um, well, uh, <laughs> another another big question. Um, I have been involved and still am involved uh, with a public private partnership, which is looking at ways to improve our methane monitoring uh, using satellites. So uh, I think that we need to do a better job of pinpointing where the largest targets of opportunity are, um, not, just to, um, uh, not just to enforce existing regulations, but to develop better new regulations as well. Um, the focus has mostly been on oil and gas, where certainly you know, there's a, a number of hot spots where you should just focus in on what's leaking in those places, and probably through a combination just of, of information as well as um, developing some form of regulatory system, target those. But the other big sources are the landfills, um, which are uh, also very large uh, sources and need a different type of regulation, which hasn't been really worked on for a long time. Um, and then agricultural production, especially animal, uh, animal raising. And there are uh, separate strategies that are sort of being looked at for each of them. Um, but again, I feel like it's uh, important that we try to pick out where the places are that are the biggest sources and work directly on those because we don't have time to um, develop a, a set of regulations that are going to work for everybody. So if we can come up with better technologies, 
in some cases, alternatives to the product completely, um, and then um, and then work on the regulatory side. I think that's where we have our our greatest opportunities. So I want everyone to um, help me in acknowledging and thanking Mary Nichols, a pioneer in the clearing air movement, continuing to make a huge difference every day. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Everybody is going to be a clean air warrior here. <laughs> <laughs> this entire group. I think we have a lot of warriors.